trouble and instead of making good progress, somehow we regressed in a lot of areas uh, in, in, in Ghana. Yeah, talking about your thesis, was it published in any journal? Uh, I, I published uh, one, one paper from it, okay. but there's, uh, you know, there's, uh, there's a system where, you know, if you Google uh, the topic or the title or the name, uh, you can actually uh, purchase, I think it's the University of uh, Michigan, where they store the archives uh, of all these theses and, and things like that. Uh, you have a remarkable um, post first degree achievement. In five years, you have completed your PhD. What, what, what is the secret? Uh, the, I think part of it was just continuation, okay. uh, you know, at the same school for my master's and my, and my PhD. I just continue okay. uh, after, the, uh, after the master's. Uh, mm -hmm. Usually, if you go to another school, you may have to do some prerequisites to see what right. happened in, in, my, in my case. Okay. Uh -huh. right. So after PhD, I thought you went on a scholarship, so you were going to come back to Ghana. Uh, no, actually, it was a scholarship given by the foreign university, All right. uh, where I was going, the University of Ghana. Mm. Uh, sorry, University, university of, of South Mi Carolina. Okay. So really, I didn't have it for a you are always prepared to come home, but you never come. Mm. Uh, and, I, and you stayed home for 25 <laughs> and years. And I stayed home for 25 years. I got my first job teaching, and then it just continued. It just mm. continued. As I say, most Ghanaians, especially those of us you know, in the classroom, so, so really I, I stayed over uh, teaching, researching, publishing, uh, you know, apart from occasional this is and maybe conferences I guess I just stayed on and really I I did not consciously plan to well, I mean before <laughs> Gimpa convinced you to come to Ghana yeah. how did your folks back home in Ghana see you as one of their own who is making it in the United States I know, uh, for, for me the background where where I grew up you just don't go and forget about your folks. Right. So constantly in touch uh, and visiting when, when I can, uh, making phone calls back home, although it wasn't easy those days. Yeah. You go and book the phone call and wait uh, to hear from, <laughs> yeah. for them to call you back to come and talk. But we kept in touch. All right. we, we, we kept mm. in touch. Never you know, forgetting where I came from. Exactly. And so no matter how successful I was in somebody's country. Uh, Ghana was always my home. This is the boy from Safo, and I never forgot that. Mm, mm. Ne so never you served that. as a role model to some people within the family, I guess. Uh, within the family, uh, but you know, in my family, as I said, I was the I was the last born. By the time I got my PhD, there were three other PhDs ahead of me. Uh, before I became a professor, there were, <laughs> there were three other professors <laughs> ahead of me. Okay. Uh, but, you know, the, the lesson there is that, you know, you, you achieve all of these things with the help of, of others, especially in my case, the older ones in the family. Yeah. Uh, so you learn to be, to be respectful, to be humble, okay. knowing that you did not do these things yourself. And then they found those useful and back to the, to the village. Mm. They, they just love that. Uh, mm -hmm. Okay. You got pushed by Gimpa to come yeah. and do what? Okay. Uh, I met the rector of Gimpa at a conference in Washington, D.C. And, you know, in his own characteristic way, he asked me. Who was the rector? Uh, a young man, what are you doing here? You're wasting time. When I look at him and say, what is he talking about? <laughs> <laughs> so he said, you know, I want you to come to Gimpa, look at what we're doing there, visit Gimpa. I came and, you know, got his office in two minutes. He said, let me just walk you around the campus. Mm. So we went around and he showed me all the things he's doing. And he said, you go back and think about friends including people who stayed in the U.S. and had come back right. to, to Ghana, talk with family people. And I said, oh, this is very interesting. And it was an exciting time to come back 
uh, to GIMPA. In 1999-2000, GIMPA was going through this transition from a small, struggling civil service institution to an academic institution that was doing great things. Uh, GIMPA was taking advantage of the institutional renewal process in Ghana, where, you know, the state uh, and Professor Ade got the government to allow GIMPA to do that. Right. So it was an exciting uh, time to come to GIMPA. We had to pay for ourselves, so by developing new programs, uh, innovative programs, new ideas. Uh, so I came in and, and looked at the place, what was going on. I said, I'm going home. And you know, some people just look at me, you know, are you sure? I said, well, if I go and it doesn't work, I can always come, come back. back. <laughs> so, uh, but I came back without much hesitation. Okay, so what really motivated you, apart from maybe the, 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 the need to innovate? Was there any pecuniary interest that brought you to Gimpa? Maybe you were attracted by fatter salaries or, you know, no, something I, else? Actually, myself and a lot of people, when you come, uh, if you consider the money, you won't come. For me, the motivating factor was really the fact that you know you can make a contribution. Right. And I think that was, that was the lead, and make a contribution. Yeah. Uh, because, um, you know, what Gempa was doing at that time, under the leadership of, of Professor Day, was, you know, new programs, new buildings, a lot of things were going on, and he says, event to the archive for future reference then look no further than AAU studios because it's your best bet with our spacious studio and state-of-the-art media equipment such as 4k panasonic video cameras kinoflow lights assorted microphones live streaming machines and others you are sure to get the best of production visit us at trinity avenue east legon adjacent the national accreditation board or contact the aau studio via the following addresses info at aau.org aau tv at aau.org ransford at aau.org alternatively you can call us on 0244-185-998 or 0244-6 Three, three, Welcome back everybody. This is AAU Impact Stories where we are celebrating academic mentors. And if you just tune in, we are talking to Professor Yao Ajiman Bedu, who was a former rector of Ghana Institute of Management and Public Administration. Prof, before we went on break. We were talking about you as a transformative young academic poached by the then rector of Gimpa to come and help rebuild this institution. We know on record that you became the substantive rector. It was just for a period of four years. Right. Were you able to achieve any ambitious program that you set yourself to do? I achieved quite a lot in my in my short period of time, and uh, and you know by the time I became the rector, if you look at the course of my academic career, I had been uh, department head, I have been associate dean, I had been dean, deputy rector, and then the rector. So you know I had seen it all right. as long as it was. Uh, in the academic area and I did, first I described myself as a teacher, a scholar, uh, manager and then now I'm, I'm calling myself uh, a, a leader. Uh, one of the things that I learned immediately is that being deputy rector and a rector are not the same. Okay. Uh, you know, in a lot of African countries you see that you know uh, subordinates have a tendency to minute on you know memos and things for your attention sir for your attention sir so everybody is passing up the ball right. it comes to your desk and you don't have a choice you have to make the decision mm. you know given my background i did not like to take decisions but all of a sudden now you are the head you have to take the decision so I learned very quickly I had to do that. Okay. For good or for bad, you have to take the decision. 
and deal with the consequences of that. So uh, that was uh, among the first change. Okay. And immediately when I assume office, also when I say it wasn't easy, when you are following in the footsteps of a very successful, uh, dynamic, and, and well crucial. not easy, uh, we're two different personalities. Right. Uh, so first I had to be myself uh, and do my own thing in my quiet demeanor. Uh, where I needed to make changes, I did. Where I had to continue with old systems, uh, I did. So, in other words, I learned to be my own person. Mm. Uh, building alliances on campus, uh, I, you know, in the first few weeks, I told the whole of Gempa, look, uh, if we work together, I know we will succeed. And when we succeed, I make sure everybody will experience and share in the benefits of our success. Right. So fortunately for me, for example, uh, we, we had some big money as soon as I took over. And everybody was asking, are we going to get bonus? Are we going to get bonus? And I said, I will try. So at academic board meeting, uh, we look at our finances and discovered we could give bonus. It was getting to Christmas. Okay. So uh, this was the decision amount of bonus. I think it was 400 Ghana cities. Of the flat rate. Sounds, you know, well kept green all the wow. time. You, go, you don't have to talk too loud for mm. people to do their work. And, mm. you know, that mm. set uh, the train uh, for what we were able to do and accomplish at, at Game Park. We got everybody on oh, board. Got, yeah, uh, some... There were some low points. Uh, and these days I tell people leadership in Ghana, in Africa, is hard. I don't use the word uh, it's not easy. It's, it's hard. Right. Uh, no matter what you do, you can't please everybody. And so, and you shouldn't. Uh, but uh, around campus, uh, Gimper's vision, I had 10 point agenda that at the end of my tenure, I want you to judge me by these things. Uh, so no matter the bad times, I stuck. I stuck with that vision. Uh, I will constantly look, look, look at it, uh, you know. So, so we, had, we had some bad times because, you know, where uh, people try to damage your reputation in Ghana. And sometimes it hurts. You know, people writing anonymous letters to accuse you of stealing money, uh, where you know you haven't taken anybody's dime. But was Gimpa not semi-autonomous? Gimpa was semi-autonomous. Grieved. And before you know, they're doing these things. And sorry to say they are doing it up to today. And anything that goes wrong at the institution, you know, ultimately, rector is responsible. But rector cannot go around every classroom to look at broken chairs, broken toilets. But everything... The bulk <laughs> lies with the rector. The bulk lies with the, with the rector. And sometimes you go home and you are drained. Yeah. You are exhausted. Uh, but I think the job was challenging and interesting. Your first term, or your term as a <laughs> rector of Gimpa, you left again the shores of Ghana. <laughs> Why? You know, uh, after my tenure, I wanted to leave the scene okay. uh, and just and just go away. I think the break is good for the institution, for the new rector coming in, and also for the outgoing uh, rector. So I I went on sabbatical leave uh, back to the to the U.S. Uh, I was going for just one year, but I ended up spending two years. Okay. Uh, after that, I went to Liberia. It was on a USAID uh, project. Uh, and I was there to help the Liberia Institute of Public Administration build their capacity. Mm. And the interesting thing is that this is an institution that we had helped over the years from with them and, and helped them uh, continue to, to build their capacity. 
And I must say that today they are doing very well. Institutions. Has you groomed individuals? You know, they, uh, I've groomed uh, some individuals. This were only like, there are at least two people there that really, uh, you know, I helped uh, to, to, to move up. One of them was my student here at Gimpa that I supervised his thesis and guess the title, Public Administration in Liberia. And then there was another one who also came to school here. Uh, but the interesting thing is that if you go to Liberia, <coughs> excuse me, today, there are a lot of senior people who came to Gempa. And I, I was among the people who trained uh, most, most of these people. Uh, at Gempa here, one of my celebrated cases was a young uh, PhD student at Legon that I needed uh, teaching research assistance, so we brought him on board. And he's still here. Uh, he's now a senior lecturer. I expect him to be a professor very soon. I mean, very hard working at all fronts. And, you know, so it's, it's so gratifying to know that I was able to impact his life. And coming back, find myself teaching with him on some of my classes. And it's, it's so interesting to have this old guy there and this young the dynamic guy, the mentor and the mentee. <laughs> and, the mentor and, the mentee. Yeah. And, and it's, you know, it makes for very exciting, exciting class. Prof, good conversations don't end. <laughs> but before we wrap up okay. on this uh, interesting thing, as an academic, who doesn't seem to want to retire? Uh, as I said, I, uh, I am academic. Uh, the years that I spent in administration, you know, I, I, I enjoyed it. Uh, I made an impact at Gimpa and across West Africa. So now I'm back to Gimpa working uh, with a PhD program, uh, bringing out uh, new PhDs. So uh, I spend most of my time, you know, not just the grading, but guiding them to do their dissertations. Uh, the teaching is limited, but one professor in South Carolina who sat me down and said, Yao, you know, doing a PhD is, is like driving a car. Once you learn the mechanics, uh, then you, you are able to do it successfully. So I'm imparting uh, that knowledge to uh, the PhD students and, and some, uh, on some of the senior programs. So apart from the PhD uh, classes, I do some of the masters and then the special uh, programs. And, uh, and I just love it. Uh, I don't know when I'm going to retire. Uh, you know, uh, as long as I can climb the stairs to come to my office, you know, the moment you stop learning and contributing, then you become irrelevant. Mm -hmm. And I want to be relevant. Contribute not just to Gimpa, but to Ghana uh, and, and, and a lot of other countries where I can. So uh -huh. what legacy are you leaving for your grandchildren? Are uh, you writing any novels or something that they will read about grandpa? Uh, I have a book to write. I, uh, I haven't started. Uh, I recall when I retire fully, one of the things I want to do is to go back to school and pass my physics exam. It's now I understand yeah, But you swap programs <laughs> from uh, science to math. You want to go back. I want to change the nine on my transcript. Uh, so, uh, but for my grandchildren, you know, for, for them to know that, you know, if they work hard, they will succeed. And they cannot ride on the success of their father, grandfather, and, and then their uncles and so forth. They have to work hard. And that in all that you do, you have to have a touch of humility because you have to be, you have to be very grateful for that and leave a legacy that others can, can emulate. I always uh, cite what I call a life of significance. It's not about how much money that you make or you leave behind. It's about the impact that you've made, uh, it could be nationwide, it could be 
uh, in small in small areas, but you need to leave uh, a legacy uh, that is worthwhile that others will, will, will learn from. We have come to the end of another episode of AAU Impact Stories, where we have been talking to Professor Yao Ajeman Bedu, former rector of Ghana Institute of Management and Public Administration. Stay tuned in for other programs on AAU TV the voice of higher education in Africa. Take care and see you next week. Bye. The Association of African Universities, AAU, is an international non-governmental organization set up by universities in Africa to promote cooperation among themselves and the international academic community. Uh, my name is Professor Etienne Ewan Eile. I am the Secretary General of the Association of Universities African Universities, which is based in Accra, in Ghana. I will talk about the creation of the Association of Universities African Africaine. Euh, il faut remonter dans les années 60 pour pouvoir comprendre le processus. Déjà en 1960, nos dirigeants estimaient que l'éducation est l'outil majeur pour pouvoir lutter contre la pauvreté et assurer le développement. I am not too much, I mean I'm the director of ICT services and knowledge management at the Association of African Universities. The Association of African Universities is a network of 400 universities in Africa. The biggest value that the universities benefit from being members of the association is this big platform that allows them to collaborate, allows them to work together, allows them to teach together. Through this platform, a university in North Africa can work with a university in Southern Africa, and also those in East Africa can work with those in West Africa. Founded November 1967 at a conference in Rabat, Morocco, by heads of African higher education institutions, the association is currently headquartered in Accra, Ghana. My name is Maxwell Amohoit. I'm the Director of Finance of the Association of African Universities. The association sustains itself from contributions from member universities and also from other development partners. Some of our development partners include the World Bank, other governmental agencies like the Swedish International Development Agency, UK Department for International uh, Development and other partners. We also receive a lot of support from other governments, especially the government of Ghana. Other partners include the African Union, which is more or less the parent organization of the Association of African Universities. The Association of African Universities hosts the Secretariat for the uh, African Union's Continental Education Strategy. And by so doing, we provide coordinating rules for the African Union in helping members achieve their targets. Déjà uh, 1960, Nos dirigeants estimaient que l'éducation est l'outil majeur pour pouvoir lutter contre la pauvreté et assurer le développement. Et rappelons-nous que les années 60, la décade 60, a été une décade où la plupart des pays africains ont obtenu leur indépendance ou ont, euh, disons, pris les dispositions pour être indépendants. C'était donc aussi l'année de développement, dans la mesure où tous ces pays indépendants devaient se retrouver de temps en temps pour parler de comment mettre ensemble leurs problèmes et trouver une solution commune à leurs problèmes. Et dans ce contexte-là, l'éducation 
était une priorité pour eux. Surtout l'éducation universitaire. Et sur ce plan-là, les universités aussi se sont organisées grâce à l'UNESCO qui a parrainé plusieurs réunions depuis euh, Madagascar jusqu'au Maroc. My name is Jonathan Umba. I'm the director of research and academic planning. The programs and projects that we run at AAU are consistent with our strategic plan and they are implemented for our higher education stakeholders, namely the higher uh, education institutions in Africa. These programs are implemented in such a way that our stakeholders will get the benefit of membership of our association. And our programs also are aligned with uh, a number of uh, global and uh, international agendas on higher education, including the Continental Education Strategy for Africa and the Agenda 2063. So these programs are aligned with uh, a number of uh, international agendas with a view to promoting higher education in Africa. The AAU is the apex organization and principal forum for consultation, exchange of information, and cooperation among universities in Africa. I am Professor Nkusa Mahao, Vice Chancellor of the National University of Lesotho in the Kingdom of Lesotho in Southern Africa. There are roughly uh, 77 universities that uh, are affiliated with the AAU uh, in the region. But as you might be aware, there are a lot more universities uh, that are as yet to take the membership of the Association of African Universities. Well, universities that are not members of the AU are missing quite a lot. First of all, let's appreciate this one point, that uh, the AAU is a main driver from the angle of training and capacitating the human resources of the continent, the agenda of the African Union 2063. So if a, an institution is not on board, it is missing the opportunity to leverage on uh, the uh, opportunities that are provided by the association in the area of uh, training, uh, human resource capital, training their own staff and students, um, the opportunities uh, that are provided by uh, the universalization of quality management uh, on higher education uh, on the continent um, and many other opportunities that are provided. In 1963, there was a une réunion à Khartoum, au Soudan, where the chef de les institutions d'enseignement supérieur ont décidé de créer euh, l'Association des universités africaines. Finalement, la création va se faire à une conférence qui s'est tenue à Rabat au Maroc et la création de l'Association des universités africaines a eu lieu le 12 novembre 1967. Je suis uh, Hassan Kafi, uh, AAU Governing Board Member representing for East African region. Also, I am the president of Plasma University, Mogadishu, Somalia. We really like to give a call for universities in, in Africa, especially in East Africa, those which are not members still in the Association of uh, African Universities. Uh, be, we are calling them because we feel the organization is ours. It represents the voice of higher education in Africa being seen all over the world. I'm here with the Association of African Universities Television, AUTV. I just want to say that uh, without the media, you won't know what's going on in the world. 
Even with the media, you sometimes don't know what's going on in the world. So you need to tune in to the reliable sources who are really on the front lines, who can give you the information you need and give you facts, uh, not conjecture, give you real news, not fake news. And this is the place to find it, AUTV. The voice of higher education in Africa. Culture is our goal, as well as to enhance staff and student mobility. Supporting the setting up of the continental agents is also important. What we have realized is that, for example, we have about 19 Francophone countries in Africa, and they have come up to form what is called CAMES, and in CAMES they are able to uh, have a, uh, a harmonized tool for promotion, for professorship, and all. So that is what we are aiming to do at continental level, to have a continental quality assurance agent. And I've seen uh, these uh, CAMES professors, uh, they say uh, proudly a uh, CAMES professor, something like that. Now, at continental level, that is what we are also aiming to do at, uh, uh, during the upper phase two, and we hope that by the end of the process, we will have achieved that. Now, coming now to the uh, in-depth of the African uh, quality rating mechanism in particular, I just want to emphasize that it's a quality self-assessment, evaluation and rating tool for African higher education institutions that support continuous quality improvement and building of the quality culture. Please, ladies and gentlemen, it can only prepare you for rankings. And it is not a ranking tool. Let me emphasize again. You can have an institutional evaluation for improvement. As you improve through this uh, evaluation using this tool, you can now be well positioned for the rankings where you can now occupy a better space, a better position than before. But it's not a ranking tool. And uh, when we look at this, it also helps you, like the way we are moving, we want uh, the higher education institutions and we want the quality assurance agencies to take on board the AQRM and make it part of what they are going to use for accreditation. And in that regard, you will realize that once you also are used as an institution to do yourselves an internal assessment when it comes to the five-year cycles of accreditation, you are always prepared and you don't have challenges at all. And uh, this one, we give it more time. And we give you time to prepare. Uh, the experts, we have uh, international experts coming to do site visits. And that will help you a lot to appreciate your shortcomings and also to take on board the recommendations that will be given. This tool, like I said, was developed by the African Union Commission through extensive dialogue with the African higher education community, including the Association of African Universities. Ladies and gentlemen, I know what some people think at times that, where is this coming from? We don't know about it. We have never been involved in the process. No, not always. Because of financial constraints, you may not have been involved in the process, but fellow Africans have been involved at all levels. They are representatives who are picked to make sure that at the end of the day, whatever initiative 
whatever tool that is uh, being developed, it's a true representation of our African higher education. So I feel comfortable to take on board and have this uh, a plea for us to buy in and make use of our truly African tools and initiatives. Uh, and this was adopted by the Conference of Ministers of Education of the African Union in 2007. So how can you say your country was not involved? For our ministers to chat uh, the discussions that they do during the African Union Commission Summit, it is those things which they request from the key stakeholders. They request the things that they will take to the African Union from institutions, from national quality assurance agencies, and from any other stakeholder, from the ministries of higher education. And so, when they are representing us at continental level, we are part. And our concerns and issues are well covered. The survey, again, is available on that link and it's for free. You don't need to pay anything to access it. Interested institutions can also visit the website of the African Associ uh, Association of African Universities. Again, if you just uh, type in aau.org forward slash h-a-q-a-a forward slash you will get to what we did in our first one. And again, we are making sure we will continue to load everything that we are doing during Aqua Phase 2. And when you visit these websites, you will really appreciate the level of consultancy that was done in order to make sure everybody is represented and is on board. With the AQRM, we want to ensure that the performance of higher education institutions in Africa can also be compared against a set of common agreed criteria, taking into account the local constitutions. We need together to pave a way for African universities to be locally relevant and globally competitive. I want to emphasize that. And um, now moving to the questionnaire itself, I said, there are no worries because we are going to provide you with the questionnaire itself. We are also providing you with the link. Basically, I'll just do an overview to say section one, background information, institutions, general information, institutions, profile, students, profile, faculties, faculty staff, governance and management, teaching and learning, and all that until we get to internationalization. Hello. Hello. Okay, thank you. So, what I want to emphasize. Hello, Miss Nodumo, can you mute your microphone, please? And I kept asking. Thank you. How much time do you need? She wouldn't say. because I'm left with a few slides here. So we have talked about uh, this other aspect of we will get a lot and we will need to work as teams being guided by our quality assurance. In the interest of time, I'll just move through quickly. The self-rating parts, institutions are supposed to rate themselves. The section three self-rating again, here, you want to make sure you choose your best three programs or best three departments and you can always use them as uh, yardsticks and maybe benchmarking internally before you move out. There's also the rating of poor performance, insufficient, satisfactory, good performance. You rate yourselves 
And when the external experts come, they will also try and help. Now, uh, the scores are there, and uh, based on the institutional information submitted, interviews with different groups will be done by those experts who come to do the site visit. And they will also do document analysis of the documents which you used to complete your questionnaire, as well as uh, a score uh, that I've showed you earlier on, and uh, also interviews with the students. These will determine the overall scores that you are going to get. Uh, the process, like I've already touched on it, is that you will complete a questionnaire and will give you at least a month to complete it, but you can't do it alone. You need a team particularly people with institutional memory are very important to be part of that team. And even selecting of the best departments, it's not a one-person thing. There's a criteria that you use, which is in the questionnaire of the AQRM, and you can use that. So uh, just... Um, to say how do we link up the AQRM with the African Standards and Guidelines. So the African Standards and Guidelines are to be instituted and to be used by institutions. Now the AQRM is a one tool that you can use to check if you are complying with the African Standards and Guidelines. And so that's one key relationship. I want to explain to you. So this is a brief summary of the African Standards and Guidelines that they've got a part A, part B, part C, like I've said before, and they will look at internal quality assurance, external quality assurance, and quality assurance agency. The slides are going to be shared. Now, in terms of supporting internal quality assurance, uh, the part A is the one which is most important for universities. It will guide you on the standards which you need to have. The part B will help the quality assurance agencies to come and uh, do uh, the assessments and the accreditation and re-accreditation. And then the part C is the one which is used to check if they are doing well. Uh, on this slide, I'm just showing you the institutions uh, which have undergone uh, the first uh, batch of institutions which underwent the uh, AQRM institutional evaluations. This is where we picked the other two institutions. I think uh, in the next few minutes, less than five to ten minutes, I'm just winding off. So you will get the slides and you will see the greater detail of it. So, what are the opportunities which are there under AQUA Phase 2? During Phase 2, which I said started in 2019 to 2022, African higher education institutions will have the opportunity to apply for the full AQRM institutional evaluation. And then we are going to have a, a verification visit. A call is going to be launched by mid-2020, so watch out on the AQUA uh, website and also on the AAU website. Continue to be in touch with us and we will tell you and inform you when the call is out. Um, that would be very good if we have many countries applying, many institutions applying. Institutions will be given a three or a four months period to complete, but because of COVID, we are not sure uh, how it will happen because sometimes people need to be in the institution uh, to get uh, uh, the uh, to get everything that they need to complete the question. So AAU will be publishing uh, the data on the impact of AQRM on institutional assessment and that can help other institutions. Even when you go to uh, the other website, which I said, aau.org slash forward slash alpha, you will see the reports uh, for the other institutions and that can guide you. Please, for more information, uh, you can contact me at uh, vimakuku at aau.org. You can also use secgen at aau.org and info at aau.org. 
for us to quickly save you, you can copy us using all those details. And again, for the information I've given you, the HAPA website. Uh, I want to thank you all for your time and attention, and uh, I hope this has been fruitful to you. I can now safely hand over to Ms. Nod Mojanini, and I hope for more information, you can still contact us. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Makuku, for a wonderful and elaborate presentation. I would now like to call upon Dr. Rita Makumbi to give her presentation. Uh, because of time, I'm requesting that uh, she doesn't spend more than nine minutes. Thank you. Thank you. Warm greetings to all of you from Uganda. I've already been introduced. In the interest of time, I'll just continue. With our experience as we're undertaking the African quality rating mechanism, I'll be giving you the rationale, the benefits, the way forward. <clears throat> as part of our training for the HAPA 2. I'm from Deja University in Uganda, and uh, I've seen most of my colleagues here. You're most welcome, all the Ugandans and all the East Africans, and all of us all. So the exercise ran from February 2017 to June 2017, and it was coordinated by the Directorate of Quality Assurance of Ndeja University, in conjunction with the Association of African Universities. <clears throat> um, an overview of what happens in Uganda, the approach to higher education reflects a guided approach uh, led by the Uganda National Council of Higher Education towards self-evaluation and self-improvement for the academia in the country. Higher education institutions should abide by the higher education quality assurance framework, which is accessible by all of us. Then uh, higher education institutions have the freedom to further enrich the program, focusing on their mission, vision, the strengths and uh, niches that they have as an institution. So there is that, that liberty that uh, we embed as we are working on our quality assurance activities. Uh, however, this situation can be a blessing and a burn if a strategic way forward is not developed within the institution itself. Uh, as the head of the QA department at Ndeje, it is critical uh, in ensuring the implementation of this strategic forward, uh, way forward to ensure a competitive advantage, given that institutions are increasing in numbers on, on, on quite a, a faster pace than what was happening before. <clears throat> so how do we come in conjunction with HAPA 1? And Deja University subscribes to the AAU newsletter, and hence we're able to receive the advertisement on the HAPA initiative project. We tendered in our interest uh, as guided by the, the, the advert. Uh, as the norm is, permission was sought and granted. 
for two of the staff to attend um, this workshop in Accra, Ghana. And the other colleague of mine we moved with is uh, the Dean Faculty of Business uh, and Management at Niger University, Dr. Mili Kwagala. I'll be telling you later on why this is very important. The workshops uh, informed us about the processes, uh, the timelines, and expectations from all of us. And it, it, was, it made things quite easier because we knew what to do. Okay. okay. On returning back to Uganda, a meeting was scheduled to, uh, with the top management committee to seek a buy-in into the idea of an institutional self-assessment. Uh, it took time, but we got positive feedback. Uh, the budgets were drawn and approved because you must have a budget as an institution to, to run the self-assessments. Uh, trainings were done because they're very fundamental in institutional assessment. Remember, you're involving colleagues who are not directly involved in day-to-day -day quality assurance mechanisms. So we had to involve the different departments as guided by the questionnaire. Uh, <clears throat> we encouraged uh, departmental best self-evaluations with our guidance so that we, they, we get the ownership. They're able to appreciate and own whatever the results will, will be. Uh, the Directorate of Quality Assurance worked with faculty deans. I already told you I moved with one of the deans. I uh, worked with directors, for example, for research, uh, the different heads of departments, and most critical, the top management. They needed to be in the know whatever we were doing at every stage. Uh, four weeks later, uh, data gathering from departments was undertaken, uh, both electronically and hard copies were requested. Remember, our work as QA officers is uh, evidence-based. So there's no we're going to come up with something, yet we do not have the right uh, evidence to support whatever we were writing uh, in the self-assessment report. Once this was compiled from the different units, we sent it back to AAU for validation. A month later, a team of experts was sent to the institution. Uh, the data field in the tool was to be corroborated with the documentary evidence and observation by the experts that came in. This was made uh, very easy because as we were working on the tool initially, we kept on collecting data. So when the experts were coming, we didn't have to scatter ourselves all over the place looking for the same data. It was quite easy because we had already done that earlier. <clears throat> then I'm continuing with the actual exercise. Uh, primarily, the verification mission dictates a visit to the institution and they came, as I've already mentioned, to validate the contents of the questionnaire vis-a-vis -vis what we have on ground. Uh, we had uh, elements uh, that included governance and management, infrastructure, finances, um, the teaching and learning aspects, uh, it gave us uh, research, publications, and innovation aspects. And most importantly, it had societal engagement. <clears throat> um, the confirmation of the information provided evidence uh, through the data we had collected. We had uh, different meetings with senior staff, the academic staff, the community, that is the people around Ndeja University that are benefiting from its existence. Then we had uh, students representatives led by the guild. We had industry. These were, these were very instrumental to, to the whole picture. And these, we worked with the deans who helped us to, to be able to access this because they're the ones who send these students out there for internship, school practice, and others. And in particular, when the team arrived, they had a word with the vice chancellor. Then they had a discussion with the full top management committee. Then uh, they had discussions with the academic staff. Allow me to mention uh, at this stage, the remaining stakeholders, we were not allowed to stay in. We were requested to move out. 
And that's what we did. We went out and I think it allowed more freedom for them to express themselves uh, without us being there maybe to bias the answers. And I think that is a practice that all of us should would continue once we get engaged in this kind of exercises. Uh, and then there was uh, looking for evidence in terms of inspection facilities. Uh, the team went to the library and in the library they actually went and also verified the e-resources. They, they had an expert in that particular area. Uh, they looked at the computer laboratories, uh, they visited our lecture halls and the offices of our staff. Then they went through some of the student support services. Us being uh, Christian based, so um, the counseling is in, in embedded in the in the chaplaincy. So that was something that we thought uh, was unique to us, but we'll get to know later. Um, they did the evaluation of the same. And then, of course, they had to look at the relevant documents. That took some good time because they kept on looking at documents uh, as guided by the indicators. And uh, finally, uh, we were called in and uh, they were asking us questions to try to evaluate the internal quality assurance processes that we had as a university since we are we are the ones that house them or we should be the ones to answer for the university on that behalf. After that visit, uh, the university received a draft report. This report provided a chance to clarify on the areas that were not clear uh, from either side. Uh, because we would see comments we could not understand and then there are areas them they did not really understand so we needed to beef up more information to, to be to make to clarify whatever we're coming up with when the final report came came back we were at the page from the side and retrospectively, Deja University and back from the department was relayed back to the AAU experts. Again, it was part of ensuring that we are on the same page because there's no way we could answer everything, yet there are experts in those particular departments who can help us clarify better so that everyone is on the same page. Um, <clears throat> the final report came back uh, and the institution was rated as good quality, which, thought, which we felt gave us a very good strategic direction for the, for the future. Having said that, we had learned a number of lessons. I'll just give you briefly what we came up with. Uh, the input of stakeholders gave a bearing for the quality assurance work we do in the university and uh, it was appreciated by the different departments that were involved. Um, allow me to mention that the presence of an equipped computer lab was a plus for us and we're very excited that it came out very well. However, the expert mentioned the need to match with the student ratios and be done urgently. And then <clears throat> in order to produce uh, more employable graduates, we will need to add more assessment methods on top of the other methods that we had in assessing our students, uh, especially the exam, the summative, which we, well, we only had the examinations. Then uh, to improve the mobility of students and staff came out strongly. Then uh, we were encouraged to create an online repository of knowledge generated within the institution. And this has been done already. Um, and we thank um, this particular initiative for guiding us in that particular area. Then um, we were guided to utilize existing involvements that we have with external associations, for example, the Roof Forum, the AAU, among others, to increase exchange opportunities for both our staff and our students. 
and this is ongoing. What are the benefits of this particular initiative? It acted as an eye opener and a wake up call on some areas that were still lagging behind in the university. For example, the implementation of a robust uh, staff development plan. Um, then it further enhanced the top management and other middle level managers to understand the advantages that accrue from a robust quality service system. Uh, someone took the first presenter talked about uh, improving the quality culture in the institution. And although the AQRM was not a ranking mechanism, it helped our university to strive for the best in implementing the recommendations mentioned earlier. Uh, through this exercise, experience was gained on how to candidly carry out a self-institutional assessment. Thank you so much for listening in. I hand over to Ms. Nadumo. Thank you very much, Dr. Rita Makumbi. Uh, we now call upon Mrs. Abigail Zama Anderson. And as she set up, I'll just make mention two or so questions that have come up from the Q&A panel. Um, answer, please, Kariu. Uh, she says, what efforts are the African Union Commission and AAU making in order to roll out and enforce the ASG across the continent, African standards and guidelines to the same extent that they are equivalent uh, standards, that, that the, they are equivalent ESG have in Europe? I think uh, this is one of the efforts that we are doing by hosting this webinar and also under the HAQA phase two project, it's one of the key uh, activities that we want to be engaged in. Then there was also a comment from Dr. Beatrice Njenga, who said that she agrees that involving the regional universities councils uh, will lead to great improvement and she hopes that it will help in advocating for internal quality assurance in our universities. Uh, Kwesi, can you set up uh, Mrs. Abigail Zama Anderson? I hope her slides are ready. Yes, everything is set. Okay, you are most welcome, Abigail. Uh, I'll give you seven minutes. Thank you. Thank you, Nodumo. And good afternoon to everyone. It's a privilege to be here to share our experience with all of you. Abigail, we can hardly hear you. I don't know if the audience can hear you. I am requesting if you could speak closer to your microphone, please. Thank you. Yes, I am. Is it better? It's not very good, so try and speak up, yes. Thank you. Um, as, she, yeah, as she organizes her sound, there was also a question from Professor Atta Diallo Hortens and the question was what strategies have been or are being put in place to get more institutions involved especially francophone and lusophone institutions and i'll request dr makuku and the team to take note of this question and uh, be able to respond to it uh, can we try again Abigail? Yes. Is it better now? Yes. Do, do, do try to speak up. Thank you. All right. Thank you. So welcome everyone. And I'm here to share with you the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology experience with the AQR 
the AQRM. And so, with this outline, well, let me just say that, as you may see, I am Abigail Jama Anderson, and an assistant registrar with the Quality Assurance and Planning Unit of the Kwame Nkrumah University of Science and Technology. And in this outline, I'll go through the introduction, the process we went through, methodology, benefits we had, the challenges we faced, and then the way forward. And with the introduction, as Dr. Makuku has already explained, the Hakka Initiative is under the AAU, and KNUST was 2017, and the team visited in June. And so the AQRM is not a ranking, it's just a benchmark to help institutions improve in their quality. And it's actually a self-rating mechanism, and so it helps you to self-evaluate yourself without thinking of ranking or any other thing. And so it's a self-assessment instrument for institutions. And the process we went through was, we had to, the institution had to complete the AQRM form, which was online. We had to, we had to complete that form. And then we were supposed to submit our best program for evaluation. But then the uh, committee that was set up, we decided to go for three programs and then out of it, select the best one, you know, to put our best foot forward. And we were to submit an institutional level development to the team. And then we were to prepare and receive the experts from a AAU to visit the institution. So that was the process. And the methodology that we used was that the investment management set up a committee. It was quite a large committee of about 15 or more members. And that was because um, information or data were to be collected from all sections of the university. And so membership of the committee included representatives from the six colleges that we had, and then we had the Institute of Distance Learning. There was a rep from there, and other relevant directorates and units, which included the library, the registrar's offices, finance, and then the physical development office. So all these members made up the committee. And let me mention this, that prior to this AQRM, KNUST had undergone a self-evaluation exercise with the National Accreditation Board of Ghana. And so with the AQRM, there were some of the information that was required that we had already gathered. This proved very useful for the committee. For instance, information on governance and then management and other teaching and learning issues, we already gathered some of the data. And so it proved useful in completing our, our online or our questionnaire. We used the representatives to obtain data from all the various units. And then the AQRM form was completed and submitted. And the committee made the necessary preparation to receive the team and they visited KNUST in June, June 2017, and it was a successful visit. And these were the three member team that visited Mr. Jonathan Inba, Professor Hendrik Jensen, and then Professor Olivier Miro Jigebe. They visited the institution as experts from AAU. And benefits of participating in the AQRM. Your last mention is a self-assessment tool. And so we went through the whole process and the ratings were uh, from poor, insufficient, satisfactory, good, and then excellent. And when we evaluated our solution, rated itself as excellent. But then when the AQRM team came, the experts came and went through the process, they rated KNUST as good. And 